Hello everybody and thank you for joining tonight. This is your host Nino and in this episode we shall be looking at a piece of draft legislation, the EU Data Act and this will be again a legal deep dive episode. Now we will be jumping straight into the matter but I would like to get three things first out of the way. First of all, this is not one of those um, management summary type videos where some matter is overly simplified and presented in five or ten minutes. This is going to be a leisurely walk along the nitty-gritty details of this planned legislation. And if you are looking for some sort of summary, then this is not for you. If you would like to see the details covered, if you would like to see this thing really, then please be my guest. Second of all, I think that should be clear, but I would like to be obvious here. This is not a piece of legal advice. Now, this is just here for the purpose of academic discussion. And indeed, I would be more than grateful to receive your comments in the comment section below. But other than that, do as you see fit and do not feel advised by this rather see it as an exchange of considerations. Third, whatever I'm saying here, I'm saying here just purely as a private person and these are only my own views. In no way have I agreed this or discussed this with my employer and therefore whatever is said herein does not necessarily re reflect the views of the enterprise I happen to work for. So with that, out of the way, let's just look into it. Now, one remark before we go into the matters of the regulation is this does not stand all alone by itself. It is said that it complements the Digital Markets Act as well as the Digital Services Act to draft pieces of legislation which are going together with it. And by the way, I should maybe also mention that the Data Act recently passed the European Parliament. So things are getting serious. But in the relevant parts, and I deem this very important, it also relates to personal data and is in some ways complementing the GDPR. See, the thing is, one gets the clear feeling as if the European Commission found a couple of things which could be fixed in the GDPR, but instead of doing that there, they did it here. And for you, such an approach bears certain legal risks as you have to judge whether the matter you're handling is underlying the EU Data Act underlying the GDPR or underlying both. And if you get that selection wrongly, it just might be so that you're not following the correct rules and thereby open yourself to liability. So that's not actually harmless. Now, what is the EU Data Act about? Well, it has three main aims to facilitate better data portability so that you can get data from one system to another, which is lovely but would be pointless without interoperability. That is, when you get the data from one system to the other, that the other system can actually do something with your data and not just store them. And of course, all of this is only then possible if you actually have access to the data. So fair access to data is also one of the main points, uh, not only in a technical fashion, but in particular also in a legal fashion. Now, if we look further, we see that there are also a couple of things the European Commission is not all that happy with. And these are, for instance, unfair contractual practices, which it wishes to curb. And this has a bit of a flair akin to certain consumer protection regulation of the past. But in this case, it is also orientated to protect small and medium enterprises, as we shall see in a moment. 
The European Commission wishes to prevent data value concentration in the hands of only a few large companies as well as market concentration. So <laughs> you don't want the giant to abduct your data nor the kraken to draw everything to itself. They would like, if possible, to have some form of chaotic competition of many small companies. That seems to be their dream anyway. And that's going to be interesting in practice, I believe. Certain limitations on data transfer are imposed here in an international context. But we are talking here of two types of data, of personal data, as well as machine-generated data from systems. And if you impose limitations on data transfer for machine-generated data, then you're going to have a very interesting life <laughs> to handle the technical questions arising therefrom when you think of how modern networks and systems work. You could ask yourself, for instance, how do you treat the echoes of a ping command as a most simple example and, and things like that. Like, I'm not sure whether they thought this through entirely, but this these limitations on international data transfers, I think may come back to bite people. <laughs> so, there are certain definitions, which we will be looking at in a moment as well, which are describing the roles of the people involved here. And one of the main persons is the data holder, which is the person who is in a position to make certain data accessible. So that's not the same thing as the roles under the GDPR, where you were having controller and processor and so on and so forth. The data holder is in a way similar to a sort of mix between controller and processor, but there are also other definitions of uh, you know people who are supplying you with systems and so on and so forth. So this data holder shall clarify what kind of data there are and what is the mode of accessing them. And moreover, upon the quest, the data holder shall make them available to, yeah, to the user, of course, but also to user selected third parties. Now that's contractually very interesting. We will go to that in a moment, as well as to state authorities in case of emergencies. But as we will see later on in this video, the concept of emergency is more than stretched. And the whole thing sort of reminds me of requests for information under GDPR rules, as well as the GDPR concept of data portability. But as opposed to the GDPR, where the portability could consist in you receiving your personal data in the form of PDF files, the Commission in this case clearly would like to go further and wants apparently technical interoperability as it is a necessity if you would like to fulfill such aims as data exchange and operation on data and so on and so forth. People don't work on PDFs, people need some more structured data formats if they want to be able to switch their operations to some other system or product. And now that we have discussed the general overview of what this is sort of about, you see provision of access to data, personal and non-personal, exchange of data, interoperability, prevention of, of unfair uh, ruling by big market players and so on. We shall go on to look at the actual legislation and its many, many, many recitals come first. So, the European Commission seems to believe, and in my view, 
perfectly correctly, that there will be in the near future products which will have some form of electronic component and will therefore generate lots and lots of data which can be used. And it mentions in recital one that products connected to the internet of things you and, and use of high quality interoperable data shall lead to data reuse. They don't want that data is generated by all sorts of appliances, but that this is somehow isolated. They would like that there is some form of market where data thus created can be used by more parties than for instance, just, you know, the person who made your lamp or the person who made your car or TV or something. They would like that this can be freely transferred and, and combined in, into perhaps new products and services. And the aim is to facilitate that because presently, I think that's true. A uh, lot of systems are rather prone to, to be isolated. And, and they are saying that the data generation is the result of the actions of at least two actors, the designer or manufacturer of a product and the user of that product. And, you know, if we look at it straight, perhaps even a lot more people. So here the view is that it's not entirely fair to attribute the generated data from, you know, turning on the lamp as this guy's turning it on or, or steering the car. It's just ending up with only those persons who, who have manufactured these products. It, it rather should be shared on a broader front. And here, then the commission states in recital five to actually quite different aims, which are both pursued by this regulation. The one is to facilitate data access and use. So you can get that data, which is being generated about you and do something with it. Though the specifications of the do something with it, as we shall later see, are a bit contradictory and facilitate switching between data processing services. So you can say, my gosh, I didn't like uh, that provider of this and this service. I didn't like this smart lamp. I want another smart lamp, but I wanted to know all the settings of when it shall be um, lighting up, when not, when am I coming home usually, when shall the heating be on and so on and so forth. And they are criticizing, and I deem also correctly, the fragmentation of information in silos. That is, you know, everybody is viciously defending his little lot of data. And the absence of standards. That is, all the data is sort of weird. Everybody's doing his or her own thing. And there isn't really much of a way what data should look like. It's like the wild west of electronic products. One may dispute whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, but they say, come on, we can't exchange data if they all look different. <laughs> like to put things simple, simply. And they call that barriers to data sharing prevent the optimal allocation of data to the benefit of society. Now, besides the Digital Markets Act and, and the Digital Services Act, as I mentioned, the GDPR also sort of influences this whole construct. And in Recital 7, the Commission is acknowledging the relation that uh, to the GDPR, but that thereby the rights under the GDPR under this regulation here shall not be limited. Well, that is sort of clear, but there you also see quite early on that they acknowledge this is not standing all by itself. Also, Recital 9 mentions that a high level of consumer protection shall be maintained. And interestingly, here consumer protection in a way seems to also relate in some ways to small and medium enterprises. At least some of the rules materially propose that. 
And in order to not have a disproportionately large scope of the whole thing and to have to like regulate the world, they are also establishing exceptions in recital 15. In contrast, certain products are primarily designed to display or play content or to record and transmit content amongst others for the use by an online service should not be covered by this regulation. Such products include, for example, personal computers, servers, uh, I find servers interesting as a point, tablets and smartphones, cameras, webcams, sound recording systems and text scanners. They require human input to produce various forms of content. And here I believe the European Commission has already entered hot waters because, um, well, it's not easy to judge in my view what sort of data we are dealing with. Of course, if they had not put exceptions like these in place, then there would be quite a lot of questions relating to intellectual property rights, right? And to, like, you cannot be demanded to share the data from, from your camera or from your scanner or like things like that, because these are evidently works and, and not some automatically generated data. And they really don't want to have these covered. They rather would like to have stuff, as I mentioned, generated by some sort of smart devices. And, and these devices, which are counted up here, typically are, are, not the, are not in the area of interest of this regulation. So. That makes sort of sense, but you realize drawing the line might be difficult. Another place where drawing the li line might be difficult is if we revisit again uh, Recital 6, where they were talking about data being generated by at least two people, namely the manufacturer and the user. What do you do with the regard to telemetry data, for instance, of systems or programs, which are showing whether something is operating in a in a healthy fashion or not. Perhaps such telemetry data would even be generated without any user involvement whatsoever. Maybe the system will just send out some sort of ping of, hey, I'm, I'm online, everything's working, right? So are these data such which should be falling under the scope of the data access and interchange provisions? Or can you say that these are not data which are relating to the use of the product? And similarly, here you see if the user is coming, coming along in a too narrow fashion, that you do not want to force access to that sort of data either. So I see here gray areas where it will be hard to define in practice in the specific cases. In many occasions, whether the data is belonging here under these exceptions, under Recital 15, or whether maybe it's not related to the use by a certain user at all, and thereby not to be provided, being just some sort of system background data, or whether indeed it is part of the data to which the user shall have access and which the user shall be in a position to exchange with others. So I see that already as an interesting, um, field of uncertainty. Now, in the spirit of what we just discussed, we shall progress to recital 18. And bearing in mind all the legal uncertainties relating to whether the data is even user generated or just part of the product or part of an excluded device. <laughs> Recital 18 is telling us such a user bears the risk and enjoys the benefits of using the connected product and should also enjoy the access to the data it generates. So we're really having here a concept not unlike usufruct. The user should therefore be entitled to derive benefit from data generated by that product and any related service. Also bear in mind here it's said in many places throughout this regulation, any related service. It's not quite 
free on the services. It seems to be services which are somehow related to that product, but it is not exactly clear in what way this relation is established. So it doesn't seem to apply to any service, but to a product related service. And, and the whole thing seems to be as an idea, an extension of ownership, that if you have a thing, you should get whatever this thing is making, right? And while that basic idea sounds actually quite nice, we shall see later on that the benefit, which may be derived, is in some ways apparently limited or limitable by the data holder, in particular regarding the development of competing products. But if you cannot develop a competing product with the data you're receiving, then it becomes a bit worthy of discussion what exactly the benefit is. Like if you get data, but all you can do is look at it, then what exactly is your benefit from that? You can say you establish a better understanding of, of the inner workings and so on and so forth. But this idea of deriving benefit is one which I encourage you to pay attention to in the further discussion, as that is also a possible source of legal risk as to what is allowed and what is not. And now, in, in the spirit of this usufruct idea, which I just mentioned, we are having recital 19 too, which is just saying, not all data generated by products or related services are easily accessible. The European Commission finds issue with that and often limited possibilities for the, possi for the portability of data exist. So they want you to be able to get the data from a product or a related service, whatever this relation is, but not any service necessarily, <laughs> in, in an easy way. And that reminds me a little bit of problems in the past, in particular with certain social networks where in order to fulfill an information request according to GDPR, you could automatically download your data from these networks. However, it turned out that, that these download possibilities were incomplete and that there was in fact data on the social network which you were not getting. For instance, imagine that you're part of some sort of group within that network and then for whatever reason, you exit that group and you're not part of that group anymore. And then you try to get, for instance, your data and it is giving you everything except groups where you're not a member of at that point in time. However, the data in the group on the network is still present, like your comments or whatever else you have put there. So that would be incomplete. And one could say that this was one of these experiences where where one needed to, well, fix things a little bit, right? So that you're not getting upon your request to receive your data, only partial data. And it will be interesting to see how the ease of accessibility will be interpreted here in practice relating to products and related services, given that now not only personal data should be supplied to you, but also the data the product generates that very well may be non-personal data. And in the spirit of addressing such points, which in a way also relate to the GDPR, we're having recital 20, which Interalia mentions that access should be granted to the user upon simple request mechanisms granting automatic execution, that is your download button basically, not requiring examination or clearance by the manufacturer or data holder. And in that regard also, Recital 21, that certain data should be directly available from the on-device data storage. Now, this of course addresses an issue we have all certainly experienced in practice. You need something from some large social network or I don't know, your tractor or something like that. And 
there's just nobody to be reached and you, you are supposed to contact someone but the line is not picked up or it is telling you that this is only for press inquiries or some similar nonsense and instead of being actually able to easily reach your contractual partner you are facing some sort of maze in order to even get through with the simplest of requests. And that is certainly not desirable when the question is about you getting the data which your product or some related service to it is generating. Here what the commission is expecting from you is that you can be able to just press a button and get your things. And so that there are no excuses. <laughs> by the manufacturer or data holder as to ah you could have read you know page 327 of the 768 pages manual in order to figure out how to get your data there is also recital 23 which is imposing duties of information so the inf the obligation to provide provide the user with the data shall be applying irrespective of the contract type and the duty of information is actually not unlike that of the GDPR telling in particular before concluding a contract for the purchase rent or lease of a product or the provision of a related service clear and sufficient information should be provided to the user on how data generated should be accessed in other words that is you know these recitals of course they are not yet the articles themselves, but they guide the interpretation. And this thing has so many recitals that it tells you it is teleologically heavy. That is that the system and aims of the commission enjoy great importance in this regulation. And when they are writing that, then all other actions which you later place under the articles will be interpreted this way. In other words, you will not be having an easy way out, an easy cop-out of um, maybe I misunderstood this article to mean something it, it doesn't mean. Like they tell you very, very clearly, very flatly in your face that the user is supposed to get his or her data easily. However, Remembering what I noted before and what we shall see in a moment that the data holder is the person who can make certain data available. The whole thing becomes a little bit more complex when you start to consider chains of economic relationships. See, the thing is you do not have in complex modern products easily one identifiable data holder. I mean, think of a laptop or a coffee machine. Somebody has produced this chip, somebody has produced that chip. One thing is showing you this set of data, another thing is showing you that set of data. So how exactly and who exactly shall inform the user and how the user is supposed to get this set of data is not necessarily regulated in a very advantageous way because it might be that as there is no duty for one single party to supply all of their information but only the one who can make the data accessible that the user has to address a dozen different parties each of which has control only over a certain shred of the entire set of data so while you're entitled to get your data and you should be informed as to how that is happening you are not entitled to get everything as a user from one party necessarily and it still therefore might become a bit of a more involved process imagine that you're having one uh, one provider who is having your coffee machine another one who is controlling a database behind it which is recording how many coffees you have made of what type and and whether there have been some malfunctions and something like that and a third one relating to some operating system data on which this database is running which your coffee machine is using you may have here three parties for a coffee machine i mean of course a little bit of an absurd example perhaps but if you imagine more complex systems like like an aircraft or something like that you may easily face many systems from which data can be obtained but without having one party which controls the data all over 
And now let us progress to a recital, which is not without legal risk, namely 24. This regulation provides no own basis for processing under the GDPR and should not be understood as conferring any new right on the data holder to use data generated by the use of a product or related service. In that case, the basis of the manufacturer to use non-personal data should be a contractual agreement between the manufacturer and the user. So <laughs> that is in, in some respects similar to the situation under the GDPR, but notice the stress on the contractual agreement. In particular, no legitimate interests or any other such similar basis uh, accounted for. And here you already see where issues can, can come from. How can the manufacturer conclude a contractual agreement with the user if, for instance, the manufacturer has no direct relationship to the user? How then can he use non-personal data? And it is strange here that you're having a little bit of a perhaps value contradiction that personal data, which one would expect to be protected better, could be used by a party based on legitimate interests, whereas non-personal data necessitates a contractual agreement. What it of course also does in its ouverture is making clear that you can't say, uh, based on, on the EU Data Act, I'm now going to process the data this or that way. No, you can't. Like, you, you do not get a basis of processing due to the data act itself. So your basis of processing gets reduced to a contractual agreement. And that of course raises questions of, does that relate also to the data holder? Is he to be treated like a manufacturer here? or only to the manufacturer, like why is the manufacturer mentioned but not the data holder? And what happens if, if the contractual agreement does not exist? Is perhaps then the data holder obliged to channel on an agreement from the manufacturer to be concluded by the user? Similar to when you say you buy a laptop and it has an operating system pre-installed and then whoever is selling you the laptop is channeling to you the license agreement for the operating system, which you then may conclude or not conclude. So is this such a situation or, or can there be some intermediaries? So in my eyes, that remains to be seen actually in practice. And speaking of contractual agreements, Recital 25 makes things further interesting by saying that contractual agreements may be insufficient and the data tends to remain under the control of the manufacturers. Think an electric car and only the manufacturer of the electric car gets the data from the electric car, making it difficult for users to obtain value. And this is unfortunately stifling innovation by small and medium enterprises. That is either your electric car maker knows what to do with this data or nobody does, but you can't have a creative small enterprise which says, hey, wait a minute, I found a way to, I don't know, extend battery life by adopting certain driving patterns or acceleration manners or things like that. And moreover, <laughs> that one is really interesting, Data holders shall further not use the data to affect the user negatively in any direct or indirect manner. What exactly is affecting a user in indirectly negatively? What happens if you figure out that the user's payment ability may be doubtful due to behavior which is shown by your 
gadget. So turning to my coffee machine, the user is permanently offering uh, ordering online coffee tabs in order to use in the machine, but he's not his um, his payment does not seem to be quite so regular. Is that something you may use for a credit rating of the user or not? It would certainly affect him negatively if you say that he is not paying properly. Then again, he's not paying properly. So <laughs> that, that that's going to to I believe cause some interesting legal discussions. Or if I have to be very evil, I could say. How exactly can you order products in an online shop for a certain user? Like, you know, online shops sometimes like to order products not in a uniform way for everybody, but according to some criteria. So have you affected the user negatively if you haven't been showing him, for instance, the cheapest products first? You could say that you made him pay more in your shop by, you know, using the fact that people don't like to click on the second page of the search results. So that would be perhaps an indirect negative affection of the user. Or what happens if you affect the user negatively by not showing him or her the products with the highest quality? But how do you determine the quality? Is it the rating? Or is it perhaps a weighted rating so that you do not have a five-star rating but just by two people count more than a four-star rating but by 800 people? So what exactly is an indirect affection of a user is, I believe, something which will also cause some discussions in the future. And you see, this is a general issue with this um, regulation. It's full of such legally indeterminate terms, which, which sound nice when you read it, right? But when you think it through how exactly to execute that, you may figure out that uh, <laughs> there, there are gray areas. Now, proceeding to recital 26, we're having also an interesting topic, which later on also gets a little bit elaborated upon. Recital 26 says, this regulation provides that such unfair terms should not be binding on that enterprise. This is basically a sort of consumer protection notion for small and medium enterprises because they are saying this whole thing of private agreements between parties sometimes doesn't work if there is a too great factual economic disbalance between them. So if you're having one big electric car manufacturer and you as a small enterprise would like to research something with its data, it might be so that you, that you can't fully exploit your innovation force because you're, for instance, somehow bound to deliver whatever you invent to that big car maker so that they use your innovative force. So, so you're having here a sort of consumer protection for small and medium enterprises, which is an interesting concept to watch. And I am quite curious how that is going to pop up in future European legislation. It is not something unheard of in the Anglo-American sphere and has been, for instance, in, in the past, a topic with warranties in English insurance law, which are sort of which are sort of sentences which are written into the contract which are strictly interpreted and which the insured person is warranting to be correct. And they are without a relation to, there's no materiality test to them. They do not need to even relate to the insured goods. So there has been also some discussion in the past as to whether they are um, like what's the difference between a warranty and a bet and so on. So there was some requirement of some interest in having them, but sometimes they were having unpredictable effects. For instance, you, you were telling that when, when you conclude a fire insurance for your house, that you will always be compliant with all laws. And then one day you're getting a parking ticket because you parked wrongly. And then your house burns down and your insurer somehow figures out that you had this parking ticket and then denies you payment. Why? Well, because you are not compliant with all laws. Not, not in a strict sense, right? But that was deemed unfair and, and, and cheating, you know? So such warranties were then uh, limited to 
to bigger enterprises and to to more sensible arrangements. Like this, this was considered just simply unfair trickery of the insured persons. And there, for instance, there were already notions of consumer protection also for small and medium enterprises. So this is an interesting concept to watch how it is going to develop in the future. Now consumer law is evidently extended beyond the limits of mere natural persons. Now progressing to recital 27, user identification may be required for data access. So who are you that wants this data? However, later on in the articles themselves, it is clarified that the identification goes only as far as the permission to have system access. So nothing like a passport copy may be required. Like this, this is possibly clarifying the GDPR in that respect and addressing a practical issue, which perhaps some of you have experienced, that some shady enterprise somehow quite evidently illegally has gotten your data. But you don't know how. So you make a request for information and they are basically requesting you back to supply them with your passport and, and your address registration and God knows what else. And you're thinking, wait, wait, wait a minute. And, and so they are effectively denying you then the request simply by <laughs> making it so unpleasant for you to execute, to give even further data to some absolutely shady um, <laughs> company that you actually do not pursue it further on. Jurisprudence in that regard by national authorities and courts has already clarified sort of in practice that only system access is, is sufficient for identification and that in particular the data controller cannot ask you further things than what he already has. So if, if all he has is a username and a name and a password or something like that, they can't ask you something beyond your username and name, like no passport copy and so on and so forth. But that's not straight written in, in the GDPR, so it's straight written here. This recital also goes on to say something a little bit, a little bit interesting, namely in case of personal data processed by a processor on behalf of the controller, the data holder should ensure that the access request is received and handled by the processor. Oh, that's weird because the request should actually be handled by the controller, right? Like a request for information is a topic for the controller, but maybe it is formulated that way because the data holder may only have a relationship to a processor and not to the controller him or herself, and that way the processor should handle should hand over the request for information to the controller who shall then fulfill it towards the user. Well, anyway, <laughs> then the next thing we are looking at is, is also again quite interesting. Recitals 28 and 29 essentially stating the user should be free to use the data for any lawful purpose. So again, here having one of those aims which state that the user should be free to use the data. And one of the things the user should be able to use the data for is to provide the data to a third party, which the user may task a data holder with. You know, Basically, the user might not want to download the data from the one party and upload it to the other party, but the mm. user might just simply tell the one data mm. holder to give her or his data to another data holder. And that data should be accurate, complete, reliable, relevant, and up to date. As for the data holder itself, well, my question here is, how can any data holder ensure this? I mean, think of it. Whether the data is correct, complete, or anything like that is not something which the data holder decides. It is something which the user is deciding. So if the user is writing that hedgehogs are fish and, and swans are mammals and insects are smart and, and things like that, then it's not upon the 
data holder to invade that or correct that, and it might be also utterly undesirable by the user that the data holder does that. Maybe the user just wants to have the data transferred from A to B in an untouched fashion. Best would perhaps be if just the one data holder, like the old one, is just creating some encrypted channel to the new data holder and transmitting that data as it stands and lies in the user's environment without further exploring it in any way whatsoever. So this is a little bit something where I am uh, thinking, I understand what they mean, right? That it's not so that the old data holder is providing the new data holder with some sort of dumbed down, low quality copy of the data, you know, all pictures downscaled, all videos in worse and quality and so on and so forth, databases incomplete. But, but here, material requirements are imposed on a person which perhaps has only formal handling of the data itself. And on we go now to a perhaps somewhat messy <laughs> point, but so it is. Recital 30, under this regulation, the user, who is a natural person, but perhaps that might be extended to enterprises under national legislation, so let's see about that, is further entitled to access all data generated by the product, personal and non-personal. I mean, that's interesting because the question is, of course, if you would like to an ease data access for small and medium enterprises, right? Then why are you delimiting the whole thing to requests by natural persons? Wouldn't it be, for instance, much more reasonable for a small and medium enterprise to be, for instance, able to request its own data in order to do its own innovation? Why does it need to have a natural person in between in order to request the data on its behalf. You know, like a person wanting that the old data holder is transferring data to the new data holder. So I see that a little bit as unsystematic and I would expect that some national legislations are extending the coverage also to companies requesting perhaps data from other companies, similar to, well, essentially how Austria did it with the GDPR, where also company data is protected. So it's not just applying to natural persons. So anyway, this then is something actually quite similar to a request for information under the GDPR. But we shall see there are actually several important differences between the two in that the GDPR does not really impose you any usage restrictions for this information. Like you can get your stuff and do with it whatever you want. Whereas here certain restrictions and limitations may be imposed by the data holder as he is providing you the data. However, how far they are is, is a very good question because if you are allowed to uh, use this data for any any legitimate purpose, like any, any legally permitted purpose, then, then how far can a limitation actually go, right? And it is further said that if the data holder and the user are joint controllers of personal data, they are expected to define their obligations under G the GDPR regarding various requests and so on, right? Because if they are joint controllers, then it very well may be that the user receives from some other customer a request for information, for information to be provided by that customer, right? And then the user has to fulfill that request for information, but may have to receive that um, that data from the data holder. And what this also demonstrates is that the roles of GDPR and EU Data Act are not symmetric. And that you can be a data controller or processor under the GDPR and be a user or data holder <laughs> under the EU Data Act. So there you see that these different play variants May, may be demanding to put in place in practice. 
And now so transfers to third parties do not get all too creative, we're having recital 31. Data may be transferred to a third party only on the request of the user and if compensation for own costs is required by the data holder, it has to be requested from the third party and be reasonable. So you can have own costs and this is the maximum compensation you can require that is no profit. And it is weird that you're, that you're fielding this as a sort of non-profit um, uh, segment of, of whatever business you're doing. But yes, okay, you can get compensation for own costs and nothing more. However, your own costs also have to be reasonable. So no fantasy costs, you can't come in a golden carriage fulfilling this request, right? And moreover, you as a data holder who is fulfilling a user request to provide data to a third party, you can request compensation for, for this service only from the third party and not from the user. Imagine that, that's contractually interesting because you as a data holder, as an old data holder, oftentimes will have no contractual relationship whatsoever with the new data holder, so you would need to enter into one. You know, you're, you're suddenly getting here multilateral relationships instead of having a star for relationship where all the data holders each are having just a contract with the user and, and the user is like getting his or her own data and providing it to whoever she or he wants to. No, here the old data holder, if the old data holder wants compensation, needs to get it from the new data holder and not from the user and not from both. Now, as I will repeat later, evidently the, the costs in the end will have to be paid by the user because the new data holder is not going to be Mother Teresa and will want money uh, for, for whatever it is paying to the old data holder in order to receive the data. Whom can it get the money from? Well, only from the user, for instance, for providing the user a new service. And if the aim of this, of this stipulation, both in Recital 31 and later on, has been to protect the user from extra costs, then one may actually ask whether that is going to work in practice all that well, because you see what will happen now. The new data holder can write off these costs as need to pay. The new data holder has no way around it. And that's how the new data holder may, may label these costs to the user. Like, I had no choice but to pay that. So maybe then the new data holder isn't even all that motivated to negotiate here much with the old data holder and to say, you know, I don't want to pay you 100, I want to pay you for this only 30, because he knows, ah, I'll pay 100 and the user will pay me 100 because the user has no choice. So by removing the user from, uh, from the payment equation, you're also denying the user any negotiation power it may have had for the transfer of the data. And you are having now as a payee, a third party which doesn't have all that much of a motivation to reduce the costs. So we shall see whether that is fulfilling quite the, the point of decreasing costs for the user or may perchance have exactly the opposite effect. All right, now let's get to a couple of things which in their nature might be seen as fundamentally GDPR topics. So third parties shall only process data for the purposes agreed with the user. All right, so we are not having here anything like legitimate interests or the like mentioned. It's what you have agreed with the user and, and nothing else. So I expect this to potentially have effects with a view to the general data protection regulation. Now looking at recital 34, the commission is seeking to explicitly prohibit dark patterns and design techniques that trick users into undesirable decisions. And if you wonder what that might mean, in my view, this is against 
consent banners with all sorts of other things where you click on something or you're misguided to click on something or you're having you know like agree and continue or manage settings and then you're getting into a labyrinth of, of, of stuff so this shall stop uh, this is already something against which Max Schrems has initiated court proceedings like his um, entity Neub, like none of your business is suing lots of companies which are having you know yes consent and big and green and somewhere in light gray no do not consent uh, and <laughs> and this is now being here simply explicitly prohibited i don't find that wrong actually i find it ridiculous the way nowadays the banners are mostly designed and only few large companies have that proper so you can say accept or reject all things like that you know like i have seen that but it's rare and now it shall actually become the rule now as to recital 35 it is being suggested that the third party should also refrain from using the data to profile individuals unless these processing activities are, and now it comes, strictly necessary to provide the service requested by the user. So, <laughs> it, it, it sounds like there is an, an aim to stop people figuring out everything about you even though it's not part of the service that you're actually there for, right? Well, what happens if they make the data collection and the profiling part of the service that you can request? Because you are requesting services that are being offered. And evidently, the third party could say, by the way, part of my service is the improvement of future services for you and other customers. Hence, you are explicitly requesting that I am profiling you. <laughs> so, so, you know, like, I don't think that that will really actually stop profiling. I think it will be just more prominently included in the services that possibly can be requested but i do expect that this might have actually repercussions for shopping carts rebate carts and things like that where uh, users just just go shopping in order to get some 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 advantage points or whatever they're called at some local shop and then somebody tries to figure out i don't know their their political preferences and stuff like that. We've seen such things. Now, moving on to the gatekeepers, we're having recital 36. The commission is against gatekeepers. And they describe that as a small number of very large companies which have emerged and which have considerable economic power. And they shall be, as far as possible, excluded from the use of data as it is being provided with the means of this regulation. Now that's interesting because that's actually stricter than the GDPR. The GDPR itself is not prohibiting that large entities may access data. And here is a little bit of a Robin Hood-like approach that large companies somehow shall be magically excluded I am not entirely sure whether that has been thought through till the end, because if you exclude, of course, large entities, you are, well, throwing, throwing um, stones in the way of your most experienced entities. And is that really something which you want to have in the end? Looking at the services available to to consumers and and enterprises, like if you take away the most powerful market players and with them perchance even the entities around them as we shall see just in a moment then i'm not sure that the remaining result is all that amazing so the title 37 is saying that certain design obligations shall not be applicable to small and medium enterprises as long as they are not partners of large companies so small and medium enterprises enjoy certain favors as long as they are not partners of large companies what is a partner of a large company and in what field 
and and in what way is, are there limits to this can you say that if somebody is using a, a rather preferred operating system or database or cloud service that, that this entity is a partner of a large company do they have to live in the digital desert in order to be nobody's partners so that i see as not very successful in its in its aim and i am not convinced that it is completely thought through as to what it might cause if executed according to the way it sounds here and i believe one should also beware because there's typically an entire ecosystem of small and medium enterprises thriving around any larger IT company. Just think of how many little companies are offering their custom software, implementation services and whatnot around the cloud services or database products of larger companies. How many small entities live off installing operating systems on servers and what will happen if you actually prohibit such entities to pro to participate in the market just because somehow evilly they gave into the temptation to partner with a larger enterprise i don't think that should be punished not to mention who is a large company i mean there are lots of companies which are large in one field but not all that large in another field like you're having perchance one large database provider and, and cloud services provider and whatnot, who however is a sort of nobody in the gaming industry. So would a small entity from the gaming industry in some way partner, because that's not a defined term, with this larger entity, is this then one of these prohibited or, or, or denigrated partnerships or not? And what it tells us. And now, as we're discussing small and medium enterprises, let's move over to recitals 39 till 41 and 51 till 55, which is essentially something like, I'm calling it, consumer protection for small and medium enterprises. So, first of all, the Commission is stressing the principle of contractual freedom, which I regard merely as a fig leaf, because you're getting so many rules prescribed that speaking of contractual freedom is just there so that they don't have to discuss topics of expropriation or something like that but that you are having um, still something like uh, you know we respect that because otherwise you're really deep in competition law matters and so on and so forth which i think however are unavoidable so that this is mentioned doesn't really bring you much advantages in practice so these recitals are targeting unfair contract terms and the burden of proof whether a contract term is fair or unfair shall be lying with the data holder. The idea is to do something against, take it or leave it, contractual situations where one large entity is offering a contract to a small entity and the small entity can decide whether to accept that contract or not to accept that contract but can't change much in that contract. Now funnily uh, this take it or leave it thing is formulated in such a way that apparently even minimal negotiation would fulfill it. We have to see what in practice that is what supervisory authorities will accept as the systematic and theological, teleological um, underlying structuring of, of this stipulation. But the degree or extent of malleability during negotiations is just not specified actually. Now, frankly, my issue with this is I always compare it to a train company. You know, like they offer you a ticket to a train, the train is going on rails, it can transport incredible weight with uh, incomparable speed and safety, and, and the train is in many regards the best transportation manner you can have for people and material. However, trains don't go when you want. Trains go when their schedule is. So, Sometimes you may have just justified reasons 
for a take it or leave it situation simply because something is a mass service. Something is served for you for half a percent of the costs that you would be having if you were to try to set up this thing yourself. And in these situations to to be demanding who knows what changes to the contract is like demanding trains to change their schedule in order to fit your whims. I don't see that as a realistic approach. So one should differentiate, in, in my view, between, so to say, evil take it or leave it situations where evidently there might be some sort of misuse of market power and then you wouldn't even need some new regulation, you could just pursue it as a competition law matter, and affairs where this is simply necessary, like an electricity provider, gas provider, like water provider, N none of these will change their system, their piping, their wires, their everything, because somebody doesn't like the take it or leave it contracts. And, and given nowadays um, information technology connections throughout the economy, the situation is similar for large providers. They also are taking mass services, bundling things, configuring things with others. Like if you're having, for instance, um, a large cloud service and you're having a large caging provider so that, that your service is being caged to remote regions in the world properly without too, too large delays, well, then this caging provision itself is very likely a standard service. Nobody's going to run after you. It's like, this is what we offer for caging. Do you take it or you don't? So I see this a little bit as a chaotic quest, you know? Let, let's see how this will turn out in practice. But if too much contractual possibilities and configurations are to be offered where end users can, can can wish for this and wish for that, then I see a sincere danger that, that Europe might be excluded from a lot of services because many providers will simply say, look, I just don't have the resources to serve everybody's whims. And anyway, if you are having unfair contractual terms, these shall be not binding on the small and medium enterprise. And, and that's really funny because this is the exact contradiction to, to what was said in the beginning. Model terms uh, ordered by the commission and imposed by the commission are to be expected. You know, this is this type of Corleone guidance, which, <laughs> which legislators in member states and in the European Union just love. They give you a set of clauses. They tell you you're not obliged to use them. They are just serving as a guidance. But if you deviate from that guidance, evidently your deviation will be will be judged and, and it's a good question whether that will be happening in your advantage or whether it will be told that uh, you shouldn't have deviated. So in a way you're forced materially, implicitly to contract according to such model clauses. However, because they're non-binding usually, you can't fight them. You can't say, I have been forced to use these and these clauses because you're not forced. Oh, formally, you're free to, to use anything, you know. So there you have how much the contractual freedom will be extended. In other words, expect model clauses that you cannot practically all that much evade. All right, now let's have some fun. We're having here recitals 42 till 47. Limited compensation for data provision on direct costs in an, and in a transparent fashion. So you can, if you're providing data, demand your own costs, but what you can demand shall be limited. It may even be so that you're not even allowed to charge your own costs. I don't know who has invented that and how they imagined this to work, but evidently entities will not be working at a loss. And this way or that, they will be trying to get their money in the end from the user. So, okay, you, you may have to detail your costs in a transparent fashion for the data provision and so on and so forth, but they'll just simply charge you 5% more, 10% more for the service. And uh, you, can, you can then request your data at ease, but you will be paying more in general. So that's what I foresee will happen. Also, settlement bodies shall be instituted 
whereby the right to address a court instead shall remain unaffected. So if you're a user and you you would like to maybe save a little bit on the court costs, which is why these these things are being established and they do exist in, in the telecommunications sphere, for instance, then you might go to such a settlement body, but you might prefer also to go to a court directly. And then we're having something which is really amusing. We will go to it later through it in detail, but data should be shared for free if possible to public institutions in case of a quasi emergency, because as we shall see later and as we shall be looking at it in detail, these things which are understood as an emergency are in many ways quite far away from that what normal people see as an emergency. So don't be fooled by this data provision for the sake of emergency situations. The, the definition is so wide that it, it can be just data provision for the sake of complacency and laziness if, if one were to put this evilly. But we shall see later the details. So trust me, the idea of emergency data provision, it has been so extended <laughs> that, that it doesn't really confine itself to really emergency situations. In fact, speaking of it, it's alive. Here you already see a sort of side effect to this whole thing. Recital 68 stipulates that data should also be usable by EU institutions for scientific research. Now that's not an emergency, right? But not if a commercial undertaking has a decisive influence, whatever that means, over that research institution, because then uh, this entity is not considered, considered a research organization for the purposes of this regulation. And we don't know what is decisive, how decisive is being qualified. We don't know what an influence exactly is. That is, do you, do you propose or decide? We don't know that decisions in one sphere or all? Does it have to be the sphere of research or can it be some other sphere? Like when is a partnership detrimental to a research organization? We are not sure, but it can be detrimental. <laughs> and I don't think I have to explain that this is a form of legal uncertainty and hence legal risk. Also noteworthy is this is more narrow than in the GDPR where private research is in fact allowed. And here for perhaps non-personal data, that shall be narrowed down. Here I see a little bit of contradiction in, in the valuations, you know. Also, what happens if the influence is positive? What happens, for instance, if some private entity is having a decisive influence in so far as it is binding the institution to keep all of its results publicly accessible for free. That is not lock them in with some, um, you know, scientific magazines and so on and so forth, but, but keep them accessible to the public. So it doesn't make any valuation of the influence. Like that would be at least according to the, to the taxation presently also covered by by this prohibition. So again, I understand the background, but the way it is just simply presented is perhaps a bit of a quick shot. And there are examples to that. Uh, if you have ever looked at the BSD license, the regents of the University of California, are certainly a term known to you. So such influence to keep research open is neither new nor unusual. And I believe that this might be an area that needs perchance further specifications. But let us return now to perchance what this regulation is all about. Recital 69 stresses that the possibility of switching between cloud services 
is, is key in this regulation. Here, however, one should keep in mind that these cloud services do different things. And there's a reason why they are in competition or existing in parallel. And that it's not always so easy to switch the cloud service. Like imagine switching between your Facebook account and your LinkedIn account. Well, in both cases, you're interacting with people and perhaps, you know, making posts, commenting on posts, entering groups and whatnot. The two platforms are still widely different and therefore you can't easily simply say, hey, my gosh, I'll just take my LinkedIn profile and, and just carry it over to Facebook. I, I don't see how that would be working. However, self-regulation has been seen as failed. <laughs> as I say, it's, it's just more than failed. It's just serving of different segments. It's not so much of a failure as it is just not doing the same thing. So recital 70 and 76 are letting a minimum regulation to be expected of cloud switching portability standards. So let's see what this was going to look like and what effects this is going to be having. But if two cloud services are just not fully doing the exact same thing, then <laughs> switching is always simply going to be an issue, right? Now, not, not that it's completely out of the question, but it's not something you can accept by and large to happen, right? Now, we are having here <laughs> uh, recital 71, of course, which is saying that this regulation is aiming to facilitate switching between data processing services while benefiting from functional equivalence. This is exactly what I was trying to explain you so far. So anyway, this functional equivalence in some cases will be given, but in many other cases, this is just going to be a pipe dream. Now, Recital 74 is saying that data processing service providers are required to offer all assistance and support that is required to make the switching process effective. However, without obliging them to develop new categories of services based on other than their own, that is, on foreign systems. Okay, what well, does that mean other than they are their own? Might they be obliged to do something with their own systems? I say maybe, maybe through the standards, right? Like standards will be imposed. So if you have to follow a standard then you may have to adjust your system. So, so while you may not have to adjust your system according to your competitor, it may very well be that you have to end up adjusting your system according to that what the European Commission then proposes as rules and compatibility standards. For the European Commission, definitely may request European standardization bodies to develop such interoperability specifications and standards. So let's look at this in the future and, and see how exactly services may be influenced by these standards and how far they will reach. All right, and now as a sort of dessert, <laughs> let's get to a really favorite topic of mine. And forgive me, but I do intend to make an interruption of this video and show you the second half later on. That is the articles and like quit it here at the recitals as we are already quite along. We went quite along with the time, but we shall first, before we do that, finish with the recitals and, and look here at a really funny area, namely recital 77 and 78 where access to non-personal data, okay, non-personal, but extra European jurisdictions shall be limited and encryption is expected and certifications and audits. And I'm really asking myself, did you think about the technical interoperation of modern systems? Because you see, these recitals sort of deal with something like quasi-transplants of GDPR principles. 
And you might even say that there might be a certain value contradiction if non-personal data might be better protected than personal data. And I say, placing such quasi GDPR requirements onto such data may hamper interoperability. I mean, think for instance of all the machine generated data, which is generated by user systems, which you need to run the internet or perform a service application or media delivery. Like, can you, for instance, share a public encryption key so that it can be used to verify the provenience of certain communication? Or can you not? Because if you cannot, how is this encryption supposed to work, right? <laughs> and, and so limiting the usage and sharing of non-personal data may have, in my view, detrimental effects on privacy, security, reliability, functionality, and whatnot of various systems. For instance, in relation to monitoring them. And so I see such requirements in tension to other legal requirements. Pardon please the external influences, but there's a little bit of a party going on in the background. <laughs> but of course, we shall not let such things as parties distract us from the standardization and semantic interoperability requirements which shall be playing a key role, as Recital 79 is saying. Now, this focus on semantic interoperability, I find rather interesting. I wonder what is meant by that, because the word itself is indicating a level of materiality beyond a most formal, merely syntactic interoperability. And so I wonder, maybe it is something that the standards will say something about. But it's strange that the word semantic is used throughout the regulation, hence this is not a random specification. And it suggests that merely formal syntactic Whatever the difference between semantic and syntactic shall be here, because the question is, in the end, can you work with this data or not? So in brief, we shall see what is meant by semantic interoperability. But recital 86 makes a couple of suggestions in that direction, namely speaking of APIs and core vocabularies of semantic interoperability. Personally, I expect that it might be something where certain standardized function or function points or function elements are defined. And to make it a requirement that at least those core functionalities can be transferred from system to system. That would make sense in my way, in, in my eyes. And now finally, let's just look at recitals 83 and 84. First of all, it's interesting regarding the penalties. No horrendous sums are just simply specified, but uh, the criteria are laid down and uh, exact penalty specifications are left to the member states, but the penalties should take into account the nature, gravity, recurrence, and duration of the infringement, and so on. Like the exact amounts, however, are not written down. So, so that's interesting. <laughs> and finally, we are having recital 84. That is an own topic of the whole EU AI Act, namely the clarification, as they call it, of the right sui generis according to the database directive. There is a sort of protection of databases which is stipulated therein, and that this protection shall not apply to data generated by a user during his use of the product. Now, this so-called clarification in my eyes is opening a lot of further questions because when you're having a clarification, it means that something always has been that way. You're just now pronouncing it clearer. 
and that means your so-called clarification is having a retroactive effect because it has always been that way. So by calling this a clarification, there may be a lot of interesting disputes which can just get reopened if some protection of the rights we generate according to the database directive has been in fact employed in order to um, exercise a right against some party. Also, if this is a clarification, it might also have indirect effects on other rights. Like if you're having other protection rights, which in some way may be seen as analogous or similar to the sui generis right according to the database directive, the question is whether their protection should be holding or not. For now, we are facing a clarification. We're not facing a regulation or stipulation of, of, of a new rule. So if that always should have been seen that way, what other things should have always been seen that way too? And then finally, we're having Oops, wrong direction. <laughs> Recital 88 stating that articles 101 and 102 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union apply unaffected and you cannot use the Data Act to restrict competition. Well, 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 well. Let's see about that because looking at the many detailed purpose-driven special rules for big companies, for this, for that, for manufacturers, for, for all sorts of participants in the economy. I am not exactly sure that there won't come along some sort of unexpected competition law affairs. In fact, I would rather expect them because clearly these, these many regulations, which we shall delve into in the second part of this outline, are so specific that they are apt to influence the competition between entities. So this again, I see as a sort of fig leaf where the, where the European Commission is basically suggesting that this all is not made to hamper competition while <laughs> in the view of everybody, this certainly will have an effect on competition one way or another. So that's it with the recitals. And as quite common with such European laws, you will see that in the second half of this video, as we go through the articles, most of these topics will appear again one way or the other. And so expect to see something like a mirror of these recitals in the articles, but that we shall go through in detail the next time. For now, I am kindly thanking you for having joined in today. I hope you'll join in next time when we finish this topic. Until then, have a great time. And from me, goodbye.